The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon if you're on the East Coast or good morning if you're on the West Coast or somewhere else in the country. My name is Becky Robinson. I'm the founder and CEO of Weaving Influence and I'm so thrilled that you've joined today's event, The Engaged Enterprise, a field guide for the servant leader with Joe Patternchak and Ken Jennings. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We're so thrilled that you're investing this hour because we believe deeply that this topic of servant leadership is exceedingly important and impactful in the workplace and we hope and expect that you're going to gain valuable information today that will help you every day and at work and at home. Um, before we get started, we do have a few important announcements and I'm sure you'll be wondering about all of these. The first is that we are recording today's broadcast and before the end of the workday, we'll be back to you with an email with some follow-up materials, including a link to that recording that you are free to share with whoever you'd like and also with a PDF of today's slides. So no need to worry too much about taking notes. You you can relax and listen and engage with the content today and then you'll have the slides available to you after. We do invite you throughout today's event to use our question panel toward the end of the hour together. I'll be coming back on camera with Joe and Ken and I'll be fielding your questions on this topic. And so what I'd like you to do right now, if you will, is take a moment to find the question panel and some of you have already begun to answer the question of where are you calling in from. I see um, several of you are, are already mentioning that. So if the rest of you would like to um, go ahead and um, share where you're calling in from, we, we can welcome you. It looks like someone from Ken's hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is here. We have Alabama and Sarasota and several from Canada and Florida and Philly and Minneapolis and Mexico. New York and thank you to all who are just now joining we're so thrilled that you're here uh, one more thing we always like to invite um, our participants to participate on social media if there are key ideas that are resonating with you we'd love to have you tweet those we're going to use a hashtag today uh, the um, and the hashtag is engaged enterprise and my team will be behind the scenes responding to those tweets and we invite you to share that with us Wow lots of folks from New York City some near me here in Michigan. I'm, I'm in Lambertville, Michigan, which is south of Ann Arbor. So welcome to my friend Tom in Ann Arbor. Um, I don't, we've never met, but you know, you're my friend because you're here. <laughs> so speaking of friendship, uh, Joe and Ken are, are longtime friends, and I think you'll enjoy getting to see the interaction between the two of them today. And both of these gen gentlemen have made a very generous offer. At the end of today's recording, I'm going to give away some books. So you need to stay on to the very end to figure out how to receive one of those books. We're going to give away five copies of Joe's latest book and five copies of Ken's latest book. So be sure to stay with us until the very end of the hour for an opportunity to be a winner of one of those valuable resources. So I'd like to take a moment to introduce these two fine gentlemen. As I mentioned, the two of them are longtime friends, and they both have done important work on this valuable topic of servant leadership. Ken is a best-selling author and a consultant. His book is The Servant the Serving Leader, co-authored with John Stalwart, and you might have participated in the past. We've done a couple of webinars here with Ken in the past, so if you've seen Ken before, um, we're thrilled to welcome him back. I'm also thrilled to introduce Joe Patternchak, who might be new to you. He's the head of Green Summit Partners, which is a consulting practice that's dedicated to help organizations bring out the best in their people. Prior to establishing Green Summit, Joe served as the chief HR officer at the Cleveland Clinic. Joe also has uh, this claim to fame that he was a Northwestern football player. He has a twin brother and a really interesting background. And as, as you know, today this webinar is covering the topic of his latest book, The Engaged Enterprise. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us and we're looking forward to learning from you. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure. Um, you ought to Google some of Joe's old pictures back when he had long flowing hair helping run the defense at Northwestern. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed over the years just hearing a lot of behind the scenes stories from Joe. And I have to say, you'll hear in today's uh, webinar how to take an organization from pretty low scores in engagement and patient satisfaction to near the top. Um, I think it's one of America's best stories on transformation. So it's my privilege. If I weren't a participant, I'd be a listener today for sure, because it's a great, great story. And 
I'm going to be taking notes again. I always learn something listening to my my buddy Joe. I'm going to uh, get off of the webcam here for a bit and then rejoin a little later in the presentation to go deeper into some of the tools that we used at the Cleveland Clinic and uh, turn this back over over to uh, over to Joe. So over you, my friend, Joe. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate the, the kind remarks, and uh, sometimes it helps to be an inside linebacker, a former inside linebacker, to do some of this work because I think we all know it's, it's certainly not easy. Uh, I had a unique experience uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, the, uh, the CEO was looking to change the culture at the, at the, at the clinic, and he really felt that uh, the chief HR role was key in doing that, and he wanted somebody from outside, outside of the industry to do that, coming from some of the great services companies which I worked for in the computer industry with digital equipment, Compaq, Hewlett Packard, and of course uh, I was the chief HR officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts before coming to the clinic, and they, uh, the idea was that the, the clinic needed to, to build a services culture on top of its great clinical culture because the rules of healthcare were changing, uh, that patients were uh, just uh, identifying a, a successful outcome is not only a great clinical outcome, but a, but a great patient experience as well. I'll talk more about that, but uh, one thing for sure I, I think very difficult to create an, a great service organization with a disengaged workforce and um, in, in the clinic and we'll show some of the some graphs that, that demonstrate that but the, the, the engagement was very low when I arrived there and I think the CEO really knew that and he really wanted the chief HR officer to, to really help him with that and I had done that in, in two of the previous industries. Next slide. Let, let's start with a, a brief definition of what is this idea of employee engagement because there are many definitions there you know, it's, a, it's a term that's misused overused at times and but this is one that resonates with me uh, and really, it's really a derivative from Watson Wyatt and there's some key words here it's a, it's a heightened emotional and intellectual connection emotional and intellectual connection with an organization their co-workers uh, the organization their managers and that influences them to provide, apply their discretionary effort to their work. Now, we all know that we have discretionary effort, uh, and we, we use discretion all the time, uh, but organizations that have high levels of engagement, have, have employees that have, have a, a passion for the organization, both emotionally and intellectually, and that allows them to uh, apply that discretionary work. So that's, for in terms of grounding for our conversation today, you know, that's the definition we'll be using. Next slide. There's seven key drivers to engagement over the years that I've, I've honed in on, and, and there are others, but based on my experience, th these are the seven that I, I consider to be the most important. And, and frankly, uh, this is not a hierarchy or anything, but because uh, every organization is just a little bit different, but this idea of being, being connected to an organization's mission, uh, I think, is, is a big driver. Uh, does anybody in the organization care about me? terms of the, the, the leadership. Is the work stimulating or is it sort of a dead-end job that it's not going anywhere and people make me feel like I'm working in a back office? Uh, are there opportunities for professional development? Can I grow here? And of course the relationship with my supervisor and colleagues, that, that direct relationship, very, very important. And does anybody care about my opinions? Uh, anybody ever ask me how I think about the work? Uh, and then finally recognition for the work that, uh, that people do. Is anybody watching me and celebrating the things that I do really, really well? So here are, these are seven key engagement drivers, and you'll see this, uh, these, several of these drivers flow out through the presentation in different forms and fashions. Next slide. What's the return on investment for, for putting our time and effort and mobilizing our organization around trying to build a, a, uh, an engaged enterprise? These are some statistics that I've, I've received from Gallup, and, and you, you can go down this list and just look at higher performance around productivity, profitability, and less absenteeism, higher customer satisfaction, and just total uh, uh, higher revenue per employee. So there, there, there's a great payoff for this, 
Uh, so it's not just a nice thing to do. It's, there are, it's a good business thing to be doing. Next slide. So why isn't more progress, if this is so important, why isn't more, has more progress been made uh, in, this, in this space? According to Gallup, only roughly 30% of all people who work in the U.S. fall into this category of being engaged. Uh, after mission accomplished at, at the Cleveland Clinic, I decided to focus my time full-time with at Green Summer Partners, write this book, uh, and uh, hopefully try to make a difference with, with some of those statistics. I also wrote this book because I, I really believe that a lot of organizations t take the wrong approach when they really want to build an engaged uh, workforce. They view it as a tactical exercise, uh, rolling out a survey, putting some action plans in place, and, and rationalizing that a few a few percentage increases every year is a big it, it, it is a big difference and they're making progress. Uh, I'd like to if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this presentation today is that building an engaged enterprise is a is an organizational change effort. It's about changing the organizational culture. And we'll talk more about that. But those are two of the main reasons why I felt compelled to start Green Summit Partners and to write this book and and uh, try to make a difference in the space. Next slide. The book is uh, hinged around five core principles about creating change, uh, particularly as, as it relates to an engaged enterprise. And uh, principle number one is real change starts with real dissatisfaction. Uh, I think we can look at any part of our personal lives uh, and look back at you know, some of the changes that, that we made either in, in a, Maybe it was a relationship, or maybe it was the fact that you wanted to get in shape, or you wanted to change a habit. Unless you had some real dissatisfaction with your current state, you probably didn't get much, much change. Oh, and by by the way, sometimes that dissatisfaction uh, doesn't have to be a burning platform in organizations. It may be just the, the 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 tension between where you are today and knowing where you could be uh, as an organization. I'll talk a little more about some some leaders who have, uh, have a healthy healthy form of uh, paranoia to keep your organization moving forward. When a mission becomes personal, it becomes a cause. I, I really believe that, that people do not follow mission statements that are on walls. Uh, but they will get behind a cause when they feel like it's per they're personally involved in it and they, they can personally see their role in that. And it's our job as leaders to help people make that personal connection. If you don't care, they won't care. And it's, it's an old axiom that uh, if people will not, will not start caring about the customer or the patient or that project or the organization until they start to feel cared for. And, and so an organization uh, needs to demonstrate that they care for people on an enterprise level and on a personal level with their supervisors. And we'll talk more about that as well. Cultures are all about habits. And uh, as human beings, we know old habits die hard, so we have to hardwire the change. And there are certain levers to, to uh, invest in and to pull in organizations that will institutionalize the change that you want to put in the organization. So you have to pay attention to that. And this is part of the organizational change and sustainability part of, uh, of, of this work. And then, of course, finally, it's, uh, it's about pyramids, not sandcastles. Nobody expects a sandcastle to last past the first tide that comes in and goes out. Uh, you know, it's just a, you know, we, how many organizational, I call those organizational fads uh, that come and go as people, uh, some leaders have an idea and, and it's focused on for a while, but it, it's not hardwired, so it doesn't become a permanent change. Uh, pyramids are built from the ground up with great engineering and they're meant to, to last for really forever. So, uh, uh, so it's, it's all about setting the right expectations around the timing around some of these changes. So these are the five principles that, that uh, the book is hinged around, and we'll be talking about each one of these a little more in detail. Next slide. I'll be drawing uh, some stories. Uh, uh, I call these notes from the field. The book is written as a field guide, so it's, a, uh, it's meant to be very practical. Uh, as a, uh, it's certainly grounded in research, but it's meant for a, a, any user, whether you're managing a large organization or a small organization, for-profit, not-for-profit, you're managing yourself, you want to influence an organization. Uh, and so I've, I've, I've written it as a field guide. Uh, I got this idea, of, you know, I'm an avid fly fisherman and self-taught, so 
which means I'm not very good. But I, I uh, every time I got into the water, I would keep keep a journal of what worked and what didn't work. And I, and a field journal, field guides are very short and uh, to the point. And you, I think you'll find this book uh, that way. Examples uh, are a case study uh, from from the Cleveland Clinic and other organizations, but primarily from from the clinic. Uh, represent the notes from the field. The clinic is one of the top five, four or five hospitals in the country. It's a, a large organization, over 43,000 people, uh, 3,200 physicians, scientists. So it's a diverse uh, organization, and you know, an organization has long term, long time been managed by doctors. It's a physician run organization of uh, 90 years, uh, and been one of the top uh, heart hospitals for over the last 20, 20. 24 years. Next slide, please. So the first principle, real change starts with real dissatisfaction. As I, as I touched on earlier, uh, in order to get some real change in the organization, you really need to have some dissatisfaction with your current state. Because this building an engaged workforce is about organizational change. Like I said, it's not about chasing some tactics. Uh, although those are important, but they've got to fit into a larger plan. So the way you, how do you mobilize an organization to really get serious about focusing on engagement? Next slide. Well, at the Cleveland Clinic, when I got there in 2008, <clears throat> we had some, some bad news. I'm not going to say bad news because in a second I'll say there's no such thing as bad news in an organization. There's only news that can, can validate the path that you're on or help you get better. And as a servant leader, uh, we've got to tell ourselves the story uh, that this is information that will help us get better. And uh, this was some of the results of the first survey. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you'll see in the red box, you know, the clinic the of engaged, actively disengaged was just 2.8 to 1. Now, according to Gallup, in, in the, in the, that, that ratio needs to look like 4 to 1 just to neutralize uh, the toxic behaviors of one negative individual. So it takes four actively engaged employees to neutralize the behaviors of one highly disengaged negative individual. Uh, and we were below that neutral state. And, and world-class organizations, according to their research, that ratio needs to look like 9.6 to 1 uh, to achieve world-class levels of service or product development. So that was interesting. Uh, it was interesting news. And the first thing that happened was that uh, normally when you or organizations and people get news like this, the first thing you want to do is dispute the data <laughs> and uh, question how valid this information really is. Uh, because after all, you know the clinic is one of the fourth ranked hospitals in the country. And so what's the problem? Uh, why, why should we even worry about this was part of the dialogue um, until uh, we had some other dissatisfying news. Next slide, please. And this other news was uh, information from the HCAP survey. This is a, a survey that the federal government had launched in 2008 as well, and it actually measures the patient experience. So the, this is sponsored by the government. It's, it's, it's uh, it's sent by the federal government to, to patients who have left the hospital. And across the left, there are a number of the, the dimensions that are measured, communications with the staff, responsiveness, cleanliness, pain management, all those things that are important to patients while they're in the hospital, in addition to, by the way, getting their medical uh, 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 problems resolved. And as you can see, the clinic was only slightly above average about when around that question, would you recommend the hospital? And average to well below average in other domains. This was a real dissatisfier. <clears throat> and I, I will tell you that I'm not so sure we would have mobilized the whole organization the way we did if we hadn't got this news. Uh, because we had a, a number of institute chairs uh, say, geez, I can't understand why we're all worried about our employee engagement. When, geez, I had a barbecue the other day at lunch and 500 people showed up. What's the problem? And uh, of course, I, I responded and said, "Well, I, I, I don't think it really tells you much, other than 
500 people will show up for a free lunch. It doesn't tell you whether they really care about the organization or feel that they're being treated well. Uh, so, again, this, what, this message was a, a real clear statement that our CEO had some foresight around this, that the patient experience now was being an important part of a, a, of a hospital's reputation and also its reimbursements. So uh, uh, the federal government would, would damp down your, your reimbursements in Medicare and Medicaid if your dissatisfaction uh, from your patients was high. So they have, have, have scales to, to do that. Uh, reputation to a hospital is, is, is really important. Uh, oh, and by the way, consumerism has come into health healthcare over the last several years in that uh, hospitals are rated for, across these dimensions. You can go online. Uh, there's transparency around quality, safety, and the patient experience, and you can choose hospitals and doctors based on that. So uh, this was, these two came together at the Cleveland Clinic to uh, recreate the dissatisfaction that we needed to mobilize our organization and create some change. Next slide, please. So principle number two, when, mission, when a mission becomes personal, it becomes a cause. <clears throat> this graphic, this illustration here was uh, drawn up by a really talented art therapist uh, in Pittsburgh. And uh, this is a, the first marath marathon that was done right after the bombings uh, that happened in Boston, uh, about two blocks from my house in Boston, by the way. And I must have watched that race you know, a dozen times while I was living there. Uh, and I had some people who, friends who had run that race a number of times, when, but when they ran this race the year after the bombings, they felt that it was more than a race, that it was a personal cause for them, that they weren't going to allow uh, themselves to be terrorized and live in fear, because there were a lot of threats of copy, copy bombers uh, in that event. But the point here is, is that most of our organizations have mission statements that we have on the wall. And they usually sit there, uh, and even if you do take it down and talk about it once in a while, it doesn't really create that passion and emotion that uh, we want, that you want, really need to have in an organization that's highly engaged. Next slide, please. Well, we had this, uh, we had this problem at the Cleveland Clinic as well, was being, you know, uh, the Gallup, Gallup measures how, how well people are connecting with the mission. And this was a low score for us which in the hospital I think is quite concerning, uh, really in, in, in any organization, but particularly in a healthcare organization where there's you know, life and death situations going on. Right? And uh, you know, we, one of the things that I began to examine uh, was uh, the language in the organization. Our CEO really gave me some luxury uh, in terms of really asking me what did I see in the organization. I have an untraveled vision. What, what did I see? And one of the things that you try to assess when you understand a culture is you look at what people are doing, but then you, you listen to the language that people are using, because language is loaded with values and belief systems. And the way we referred to people at the Cleveland Clinic was uh, the, the professional staff and, and the non-professional staff, uh, the doctors and the non-doctors. Now. It's pretty hard, I think, to come to work every day and be committed to the mission if you're a non-something. Uh, and this is what I shared with our CEO. I had never worked anywhere where we had employees. We had associates, partners, we had uh, engineers, uh, but non-professionals uh, just didn't resonate. So uh, we recommended that uh, we change the name to, to everybody who worked at the clinic clinic, uh, that we all were caregivers, no matter if we delivered food, if we cleaned the rooms, if we were a doctor, if we were a nurse at the, at, at the at bedside, if you were a greeter, if you were calling somebody about their bill, all of us had the opportunity to create an impression uh, and a patient and a, and experience. We took 43,000 people offline over a nine-month period and ran people through a, a three-and-a-half-hour workshop uh, and cross-functional groups, doctors included. Uh, talking about how we each had a role with a patient or a family member and, and the touch points in the hospital. So it was a powerful intervention, and we, we reset the organizational language 
Next slide. Principle three, if, if you don't care, they won't care. Uh, all these principles are important, I feel, but uh, this, is, this is one that really, I think, really stands out in my mind. Uh, and this is an area that I think uh, it's a real challenge for, for leaders. This graphic kind of hopefully depicts all of the <laughs> metrics we have to manage, all of the uh, customer issues we have to manage, but we also have to manage uh, this, this heart factor. Uh, that demonstrates that, that we care about our, the people who work in our organization if we're going to be successful here. Next slide. So as I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you've got to do things on an, on, on an enterprise level and on a personal level. Uh, and here are two launches that we had early in our change effort demonstrate that we, we cared for our, our, our employees. And we launched a, 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 a very intensive and free wellness effort. And it was one of the first times that the clinic gave away a lot of free things. <laughs> uh, but I took some money off the uh, health plan. And the first year, we actually gave people $100 just to get into Weight Watchers. Right? Because we had a workforce that, frankly, wasn't healthy. And, uh, our, and it was, I think it's, it was important for us to demonstrate that that we, we were committed to the, the, the well-being and health of our own employees. So over the years, this, uh, this took on a life of its own. Uh, it, it became a, a real, frankly, a way for us to reduce our costs. We saved $78 million over a five-year period uh, because it turned into a, a healthy choice rebate program, and everybody could sign up and be part of it. But we didn't launch it as a cost-saving effort. We launched it as one way from an enterprise perspective that we demonstrated caring for our people. Next slide. The other thing that we launched was a, a strategic recognition program. As I mentioned, I've worked in three different industries. And within healthcare, you know, I, was, I never ceased to be amazed at the power of a thank you, how powerful that is. Uh, in the computer industry, you know, it's just a different culture. You know, a uh, thank you has to have a little more money behind it. <laughs> Recognition's got to have be a little more tangible that way. But in healthcare, just a personal thank you really is a powerful thing. And I, I'm not sure why, other than maybe you know some of these jobs uh, are difficult to do. They're tiring and emotionally draining, and no one expects a thank you. Uh, so we 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 built on that built on that dynamic and launched uh, our a strategic uh, recognition program called Care Se Caregiver Celebrations. And uh, it's not anything too uh, exorbitant. Uh, you can get online and send a peer or a manager uh, a online certificate that says thank you for representing one of our values like teamwork or service or quality. And by the way, that, that person's manager is copying on that, on that uh, on that certificate. And so you have uh, people being recognized two ways, certainly as as the individual who, who sent it, but also the boss. All right? And we found that when, at one point we were, we were rolling out 20,000 of these awards every, every month. And we, we did a direct correlation that, uh, that work groups that had a, a higher level of uh, engagement were using this program much more than anybody else. So. Uh, they were, these were the two things early on that were uh, visible uh, and one that were, were some early wins. And you need some of those early wins because, as I mentioned, you know, we're building pyramids here, right? And it takes, it does take time. So you need some early wins in your change effort. Next slide, please. The thing that sustains this change, however, and, and really, as I mentioned, people work for leaders and not necessarily companies. Um, we had to really look at the way we were managing and leading in our organization. The Cleveland Clinic was very heavily steeped in this command and control. And of course, uh, down the left dimension are the normal descriptions of, of command and control environment. Down the right are some of the descriptors of, of, of servant leadership. One relies on power, the other one relies on the moral authority. Uh, putting the organization first and serving the organization. Command and control is more about serving yourself as a leader. 
uh, not necessarily uh, uh, viewing people um, with dignity and respect. Now, command and control is not necessarily a bad model uh, for a certain situation. If anybody has been in the military, uh, you, you learn how to follow orders uh, or people can die. Uh, if, you're in, if you're a surgeon and you need something, I mean, you need something. Uh, as I mentioned, I played three years of Big Ten football at Northwestern, and when it's, when it's third and short and the coach calls the play, you don't do consensus management in the huddle. <laughs> I think we should pass. No, I think we should go off tackle. Or worse yet, maybe we should let some air out of the football or something. You know? No, you pretty much line up and, and, and run the play. But if you're trying to build a engaged workforce, uh, command and control doesn't translate all that well. Uh, it creates fear. It shuts people down. And so I, uh, early on, recommended servant leadership as the replacement model for command and control and put enough qualifiers on that to make sure that uh, I, uh, if people didn't uh, support servant leadership, that I'd find another model. But we certainly couldn't stay in command and control and expect to, over time, sustain an engaged workforce. Uh, and over time, uh, we, uh, this became the acceptable model. And we, we, I'll, I'll talk later about how we've uh, enculturated this. Next slide. So this is also uh, good news in terms of better return on investment. Uh, we all might be familiar with Collins' book, Good to Great, and where he did a 10-year study that showed the good to great companies had a much higher return, 17.5% to 10.8% return, total return, where Spear and Frick, and in their book, The Seven Pillars of Servant Leadership, they actually saw that servant-led companies that used some form of servant leadership actually had over a 24% return. So the facts are that servant-led organizations have more highly engaged employees that move customers from just being satisfied to loyal customers and achieve better results. Next slide. And this is, uh, these are some companies from Gallup's database, uh, in their top 25% of their performers, and some very familiar uh, logos and brand names that uh, are actually achieving this in their particular marketplaces. Next slide. So that led me to Ken Jennings. Uh, and uh, when we uh, did a lot of awareness uh, around, uh, around servant leadership, did, some, did a soft launch. And, but uh, before I, we, we did that, I had to find a thought leader. Uh, and I did a six-month ex exhaustive search throughout the country for uh, the best serv servant leader thought leaders and ones that would fit the culture at the Cleveland Clinic. And through a, a series of, I would say, providential steps <laughs> uh, led me to, to find Ken Jennings. And uh, in our first meeting, he told me that uh, as we ended the meeting, <laughs> that he was, really, he was probably the best out there. And, and, uh, I, uh, and he did not prove himself wrong at all. So I'll turn this over to Ken, and he'll, he'll talk a little bit about the serving leader and some of the things that we did at the clinic. So I think on the slide here we have, uh, let's go back to the slide just for a second, um, just to alert uh, people that they could also, in addition to Joe's great book, pick up a copy of The Serving Leader, co-authored with John Stallworth, and we had a lot of fun writing this book. I think what was uh, different that Joe was looking for, servant leadership has been around and is a high-impact approach. But the field wasn't necessarily full of practical tools and approaches. So when I got started in this journey of servant leadership, uh, we wrote the book, The Serving Leader, and then invested in developing extremely practical tools that a work team, nurses, physicians, administrators, uh, financial services organizations could pick up these tools and know what they're actually doing day to day. So. Uh, uh, Joe, we called the book The Serving, I-N-G, uh, Leader on Purpose. Uh, it's meant to say, what do you see people actually doing, right. serving? What are they practically doing? And uh, 
We started, as Joe said, with a soft launch. We took the tools and approaches to those that wanted them throughout the clinic, big place. And then we let the results speak for itself. You could almost look at the rise in engagement scores and other practical results by where this was being implemented. So neither Joe nor I or our team had to argue for implementation. We had the insiders that were pretty much arguing for, you got to get this stuff. You got to get this stuff. And uh, it's going, you couldn't stop it now. Servant leadership is going great guns uh, with Joe's sponsorship at the clinic. It's going great guns, getting broader and broader uptake. And as a beacon for practice of servant leadership uh, throughout uh, throughout healthcare. So next slide, I just have one that I want to slide in here. Um, the serving leader tools and approaches that uh, Joe sponsored and that uh, Third River implemented on his behalf throughout the organization were built around these five uh, uh, approaches, actions of a serving leader. And we have this upside down pyramid to say, signal that it's not the typical hierarchical pyramid of I'm at the top, aren't you lucky, uh, you that are down below me. This is meant to communicate that a serving leader is at the bottom of the pyramid empowering others. So I'm just going to touch on these actions and then turn it back to Joe to tell you the rest of the story at the clinic. A serving leader builds on strength. He knows the strengths of each individual in the team and the team itself so as to build on it not just get rid of weaknesses, but build on the strength of the team so you get better and better in what you do. Blazing the trail uh, refers to spotting those barriers and obstacles that stand in the way of a team or a team member to do their job well. And a ser serving leader is one that helps break through those barriers and obstacles. Uh, Joe's going to mention some of these in the last part of our talk today. Raising the bar has to do with the practical action of setting hard, specific, and clear goals every day in every way so that your team becomes better and better at what they do. You expect the best, and you get the best. You expect things that are uh, in service of the organization's greater goals and breakthroughs. The fourth action being here, upending the pyramid, uh, getting your ego out of the way so that you're the one that is not filling up the room with your own ego, leaving room for others to have ideas and breakthroughs. I'm sure we've all been in meetings where someone has just has to have all the airtime and just sucks the oxygen out of the room. Uh, here, a serving leader lets others perform. And the last one that really resonates with the greater goal that Joe already, already mentioned here, running to a great purpose. Uh, we don't invite people through the tools we put in place to join a company. With it, we put them in place to join a cause. And that's what servant leadership does here. Uh, we invite you to pick the book up here, along with Joe's excellent book, of course, and learn some of the practical tools by going to the Third River website and just read about the tools. So, uh, Joe, we're, we've had a lot of fun over the years implementing these tools, and we're going to have a lot more fun doing it. I hope around the country. So let me turn this back to you to uh, take our audience on home with the rest of the story at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you. Okay, next slide. You know, one of the, as, as Ken mentioned, one of the things that you you fear when you leave an organization uh, is that uh, does some of the work that you you started there uh, and and put in place that it. Would, would it remain, and the servant leadership has not only remained, but as Ken mentioned, it's gone viral. So, uh, and this is one of the things that's helping, I, I think, really sustain our uh, engagement there through the, some of the difficult changes that healthcare is going through. Uh, principle four, these are the last two, and uh, this idea of uh, old habits die hard, so hardwire the change. I actually uh, took this from my experience in the computer industry, that, uh, you know, if you really want a computer to do something in a mission critical environment and it can't fail, you can't rely on the software, uh, and you can't rely on a backup, you, you hardwire that chain. Now there aren't many of those situations, uh, but I thought it was, it was an interesting uh, way to, to think about institutionalizing and culturating the change you want to put in an organization. 
Uh, next slide. And here are some of the ways uh, that we that we that we did that. We looked at the, the one thing that that and I went to Gallup and I asked them this because in a second you'll see that we didn't get much of uh, progress our first year. And uh, in, I, I'm one that likes to be employed. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, felt like I just needed to get from Gallup because we had put a lot of work into this and it hadn't gone anywhere. And I said, what's the one thing, if we do this one thing really well, uh, that we'll begin to get some, some movement? And they pointed me to this idea that it starts with a plan. If you can get your managers, every manager having a quality plan, sit down with their employees, do a quality plan with, with actionable goals, you'll get some movement. So we did that, and we we actually you know I, I also believe you get what you get what you inspect, and so we quality checked these four thousand plans and found out that the many of them eighty percent of them need to be had to be redone because they they really weren't actionable plans. So we did a lot of coaching, and we for the first year built some really good plans, and we got some really good movement. And that, and of course once managers learned how to do these plans, they were more comfortable in doing them the second time, and, and then every year. I, out. We also weighted 40% of a manager's performance on how well they were making progress against their engagement plans. Uh, were they were they doing the right things? Of course, we, we applied some judgment there as well. All right, to some people inherited some pretty negative organizations, but 40% of that manager's performance was based on how well that they were doing against engagement. We did a lot of engagement coaching, mentoring, and yes, transition. Uh, after the first two years, any manager who was in the bottom quartile could not get more than an average uh, performance rating. And we got, got them some special coaching. Some got better. Some were asked to become individual contributors, and some left the company. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's just something, uh, something that, that, that you have to do in this, in, in this kind of change effort. As Ken mentioned, we put serving leader competency based development and all of our uh, development and all, all of our succession planning uh, and rolled out some really intensive cohort development that uh, helped people not only with uh, their long-term development but actually put them on some projects. And these projects got much better results because of the serving leader toolkit that uh, Ken and his team rolled out. The last three bullets, we put, we put the the idea of engagement as part of an executive dashboard and turned it into an ongoing process as opposed to an annual process every year. Uh, we pulsed, uh, surveyed uh, twice a year, and it was pulsing on not on the on the on how, how well people felt engaged, but actually the engagement plans. Uh, did, did the manager have a plan? Were they making progress against the plan? Did people meet and discuss the plan? And we could get uh, an idea of, of this process survey, whether or not people were managing, managing the engagement process. And then I turned this into a dashboard and review, and, and all the above points I would, once a month, make this visible to the executive team. And then we would invite some members uh, of our uh, leadership team who are out in, uh, out in, out in front of people and, and uh, first line supervisors and ask them to come into our executive team meetings and give a presentation about the work they were do they were doing around building an engaged workforce and the results that they were getting. And that sent tremors through the organization that people were actually coming up and giving the presentation to the executive team. But I think equally as important, it created a sense of reality uh, for the for the leadership team, you know, an executive team, you know, we, we think we know everything. We think that we're really in touch with what's going on in the organization, but we we're, we're really not. And when these people came up and began to present what they were doing, uh, it got us a lot more closer to what the front lines were really dealing with. So uh, this, the engagement agenda and the, and, the, and the change agenda was built across all these dimensions. And uh, it was our way of hardwiring the change within the organization. Uh, next slide. So finally, it, again, it's, it's not about building sandcastles. It's about building pyramids. Uh, 
when we, and, and when, in a change effort like this, in any change effort, it, you, you really have to work hard at managing people's expectations. It doesn't come overnight. And uh, uh, next slide, please. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about managing expectations. You'll see from 2008 to 2009, we actually stayed flat. Some actually even dipped a little bit lower. And uh, I had a meeting with our CEO, and he felt this was the first. This is the worst news he had heard in five years. And we put all this effort into it, and nothing happened really. And of course, I I leveraged that dissatisfaction to get 40% of a manager's performance rating uh, weighted on employee engagement. Uh, so I embraced that that level of dissatisfaction to to uh, make an, make that change. But you can see that uh, over the five-year period, we went from the 44th percentile to the 87th percentile. And uh, that red line is the age cap scores, the patient experience scores. They map right along with that rise in the employee engagement scores. And you'll see at the bottom of this slide, our philanthropy went up 47% over that same period. Uh, really, uh, hospitals cannot survive without some level of philanthropy. And, and uh, we, we call this our grateful patient uh, contribution, where we go to people after they had, a, had, a, had an experience at the clinic and ask them would they consider being a grateful patient. And by the way, that, this was outside of any major building campaign or anything else. This was just uh, people uh, who had been in the hospital and had, had their experience there. And uh, if you can save someone's life. But they may not be a grateful patient that they had a real bad experience. So uh, I think this was another indicator that uh, we were making great progress. Next slide, please. What about the engagement ratio uh, that we started on, uh, started the presentation with? As you can see, in 2008, that ratio was 2.8 to 1, 4.1, uh, 4 to 1 just to be neutral, 9.6 to 1 to be world class. At the end of 2013, uh, that ratio had had uh, skyrocketed to 10 point to 10 to 1. So uh, we we're delivering world class patient experience uh, because we had world class scores. Next slide. So again, just a summary of the five principles uh, that the book has been built around. Next slide. And so uh, what's, the, what's the call to action for you? Uh, certainly would love for you to uh, go on Amazon and find the book and, and buy the book. Uh, buy a copy for your friends and neighbors, all the people in Section 16 of your favorite baseball, <laughs> baseball field. Uh, learn more about it at my, uh, at, uh, my website, Green Summit Partners, uh, or call me. Uh, email me, call me, and uh, would love to talk to you about uh, any challenges you may have in transforming your organization. Next slide. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and now's the time for any questions, uh, comments, and reactions you may have. Sure. Uh, Joe and Ken, we do have several questions that have come in. And I like this one. It's quite interesting. Kevin is wondering, with all the uses and misuses of the term servant leadership, what do you think of a different term, the leading servant? Well, uh, I'm, uh, Ken's, Ken's the real expert on this, but I, I will tell you that my interpretation of it is that what comes first, your desire to lead or your desire to serve? And I really believe that the best servant leaders are those who are called because they want to serve, but they want to serve in a broader way. They want to influence more people. They want to serve their people and serve the organization in a broader way. So uh, there are a lot of debates about this, but just in my experience, those who feel that they're called to serve first and then lead become better servant leaders. You know, I, I also add to that by saying, uh, who is it that has that actually can call you a serving leader? It isn't you yourself by self-proclamation. It's those that work with and for you. So the idea of judging if someone is a serving leader every day by their actions 
we particularly with Joe's endorsement, we put two things together. One is uh, we assessed leaders against how they were doing in creating engagement, but then we handed them the tools to becoming a more engaging leader with the five actions of, of serving leaders, upending the pyramid, building on strengths, blazing the trail, and so forth. It's no good just to ex expect leadership performance. You have to also give them the tools and the training to do it. And uh, Joe and his team created a unique environment where the tools were actually put to work. It's what a consultant dreams about is having a partner like Joe that will design a complex system so that people can do the right thing, and then we can provide the tools to help them do it. And it was a win-win. So I think you judge a serving leader by what they do, but you have to give them the tools to do it. That's very helpful. Um, ben is wondering if the two of you can talk a bit more, and uh, Joe, this might be a question for you at first, about hardwiring these concepts into the organization. Yeah, I, I think that the, uh, you've got to view this, as, a, as I mentioned, as an organizational change effort. And that means that you, you've got to look at the, the, the organizational model that you have uh, that you're working from. Uh, what, are the, what are the areas uh, of talent management that you're working on? What are the areas of development that you're working on? What are the things that you're doing to reinforce your mission every day? What are, what are your, what's your total rewards uh, uh, look like for the organization? And build your, chain, you build your change agenda and your messaging into all those levers. So that all so people can connect the dots. The worst case situation is if you have a fragmented approach, and you have this new program and that new program and this new program, that, and people don't see the larger strategic framework that you're working from. Uh, they can get a little more. Get, they can be clear for them. They can say, "Hey, geez, wow, this is a they really this is really a, a people strategy in our organization, right?" And we're communicating and connecting all those dots. So I think. Viewing it as a change effort and having it, viewing it as a people strategy as part of your overall business strategy, uh, you'll have a better opportunity to, for, for people to see that these aren't just uh, individual tactics being rolled out and they're not connected. Yeah, I, I agree with all that, of course. And I think one of the underappreciated approaches that our friends in human resources should have their hands on is uh, wiring an organization or collaboration through the design of jobs, job, de job design, and taking a hard look at uh, people tend to do what they're rewarded for, and they tend to work hard on behalf of the colleagues they see every day. So if you design jobs so that they are naturally in partnership with others in pursuit of patient excellence or doing the right thing, they're working in teams. Sometimes that requires you to redesign the physical space of where people work so they can see each other, not just divided up into cubby holes or departments. But think about, uh, think about excellence in job design. So we do things collaboratively, naturally. And I saw uh, that at the clinic, uh, working with multifunctional teams. What other questions are popping up out there, Becky? Uh, just a gazillion questions. Uh, I find this one to be quite interesting. Roy is wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the calling and the calling to servant leadership, and how do you know that you're called? Well, it's a, it's a fantastic question. I want to let Joe speak first, and maybe he'll even be personal a bit about how he knew was, he was called to be a servant leader at the clinic. Well... I, uh, I had an opportunity, you know, it, moving back to Cleveland, I'm originally from Northeast Ohio, uh, in a small steel town, Warren Youngstown area, uh, actually a little township called Howland Township, and, and I didn't, wasn't all interested in moving back to Northeast Ohio uh, after I lived 30 years in Boston, uh, but I went out there. And I had a uh, series of, I think, uh, mo uh, moments that I consider to be signs of providence, okay, right, <laughs> for myself. I Going for my final interview with, with the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and I know that our CEO was going to offer me this job, and I was, I was thinking how I could postpone this offer because I had some other things going on in Boston. 
And so I decided to wake up in the morning and just put myself in, in the environment to see how it felt. Uh, my meeting was 8 o'clock, so I, you know, I'm up at you know, 7 o'clock and then walk through the hospital. And then 7.30, I stop into the chapel. And uh, someone, uh, I thought I was alone in there. And, and uh, I must have had a distressed look on my face because one of the environmental services workers comes up to me and taps me on the shoulder and kind of startles me and said, Sir, are you okay? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And uh, he said, uh, well, you look really upset. And I said, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. And I thought he left, and he came back again. He said, sir, I, I'm just going to let you know that I'm going to keep you and your family in my thoughts and prayers today. So um, I thought that was pretty interesting emotional connection. And I went from there to my discussion with our CEO, and I told him what happened. He then gave me a tour of the critical heart care unit that he was a giant on for many years. And, and he came down in uh, his office and he said, Joe, this is why we're here. The sickest people in the world come here. And 99% of them come home. Now we want you here, you know. Are you coming? I said, yeah, I'm coming. That's so, a great story. You know, so it's different for everybody, but I think my advice would be to you is to don't discount these things that happen in your life as being coincidental. You've got to be listening, okay, All right? Uh, and uh, and that's how the, you know uh, you may feel that you're called to serve in a, in a more broader way than what you're doing right now. So I have to I have to say, few. I've been an external consultant for many years, and I'm kind of typecast that way. My experience with Joe uh, transcended a, uh, an assignment, went over multiple years, and we became great friends, I'm happy to say. And part of what I felt was one of the few times in my career I got to serve an executive who was serving others. Um, we weren't just rolling out commercial products. That went very well, and we're really happy about it. But we got to pour tools and resources through Joe into those who needed it. And at one point, Joe let me spend a, a full day with the 30 or so uh, winners of, of a special award at the clinic. They were picked by their peers for their outstanding service. And in the day I spent with them, I realized they were natural serving leaders. They led with their heart. What we were doing was handing them wrenches and tools to do what they already wanted to do because of their passion, their calling, do it better. So uh, I think this is a search for those who have it in their heart in many ways to serve others and then get the mission done through others. We're handing them tools and empowerment. So uh, you look at the results that were on Joe's slides. This is one of America's great stories. It really is one of America's great stories. And I, I do want you to get in touch with Joe. He has a lot more to tell you. And it's worth your time. Um, Becky, I know we're getting toward the end of our time together as well, but um, I've appreciated your team who serves us as writers well. Thank you very much. And I look forward to you giving some books away. I think you wanted to speak, speak to that as we ended up here in our last two minutes. I did. Thank you, Ken. Thank you again to all of you who have invested in this hour with us. And I know that I've been challenged to consider again how I can serve my team and others. And so what I want to invite you to do right now is to send me an email. My email address is Becky at weavinginfluence.com. What I'd like to hear from you in the email is if we were to do another webinar on this topic of the engaged enterprise and the serving leader with Ken and Joe, what would you most like to hear about next? Is there one of the topics that we covered today that you'd like to hear more about? So if you could email me from those replies, I will select the five winners of the serving leader and the engaged enterprise that we'll get out to you in the mail very soon. And what I also hope you'll do is even if you think you might win a copy of the book, 
I'm guessing that you might have a colleague or a friend or someone else in the world that you think could benefit from the book. And so what I'd love to see everyone do as a result of this webinar, of course, is to go and buy both of these books and support these authors in, in spreading this powerful message in the world. And then I will be sending a, an email follow-up that will have some more ways that you can stay in touch with these authors. So Joe, thank you so much for today. Ken, thank you for being a part of this webinar. And we look forward to potentially being back with you in the future with another topic, digging deeper uh, into these uh, important ideas. So thank you, gentlemen. Go and serve. Thank you.